So I've been running a pretty aggressive fat loss diet over the past couple of weeks that has me eating around 1,000 to 1,200 calories each day. To give you guys a reference point, my typical maintenance calorie intake, which is the amount of calories that I need to eat each day just to maintain my body weight at about 75 kilos when I started dieting, is around 2,500 calories or so, give or take a couple hundred calories in other direction. So really, doing this diet has me eating at least 1,000 calories below what my basic needs are, and there is definitely a risk of things like muscle and strength loss by doing this. So naturally, when I posted this up on my Instagram here, there were a lot of questions and concerns around this whole setup. So today, I wanna to talk a little bit more about why I prefer aggressive diets like this instead of slow, steady diets over longer periods of time, and go a little bit deeper into some of the questions here around concepts like fears around slowing down your metabolism or losing muscle mass by doing this kind of diet setup. So whether or not you wanna try an aggressive diet approach like this or not, hopefully you've gotta pick up some useful ideas for fat loss dieting in general. So first of all, why am I doing things so aggressively? The first and most obvious reason why I prefer this over a more typical diet is because it's a whole lot quicker. The results that you see here are from just nine days of dieting. I came down around two and a half kilos or a bit over five pounds. Now, of course, all of this is not all fat and there is gonna be some fluid loss and stored glycogen from muscles as well that will be contributing to that weight loss. But it's pretty obvious that there is at least some fat loss that's come along with that. Now, if I took a more conservative approach, this sort of results may take around four to five weeks to achieve instead of the nine days. So when it comes to setting up a big cut like this, the most important concept to be addressing is what is the quickest rate of weight loss that I can sustain each week with the majority of it coming from fat whilst preserving muscle tissue. There is a little bit of research out there that indicates it's around the 0.75 to 1.5% of body weights per week. It varies a lot based on your experience and your start point and how much body fat you have to lose overall. But for me, starting out at about 75 kilograms, that would be about half a kilo to around a kilo a week. Now, if you were to do the math on that and work out what that sort of deficit might look like, that would actually have me eating at about 1500 calories. So I'm definitely tracking things a lot more aggressively than I technically need to, but like most people, I make mistakes when it comes to tracking my intake. So doing a much larger cut in calories like this down to 1200 or 1000 helps to reduce the potential damage of misreporting intake. For example, if I was only in a mild 200 calorie deficit, if I misreported by 200 calories, which is very easy to do, that would be a day or maybe several days where I'm no longer in a deficit for fat loss. Whereas if my calories are set super low, going over by a couple of hundred calories every couple of days will still have me in a deficit. Now, this won't apply to everybody, of course, but this strategy works really well for me. So anyway, let's start talking about some of the major concerns that comes out when we're looking at aggressive cuts, which is muscle loss. It's a very real concern and something that I do have a high likelihood of experiencing due to how hard I'm pushing things. However, it's not really something that I'm worried about. First of all, as long as I'm not overdoing my training and I'm eating sufficient amounts of protein, which I am, I shouldn't be putting my body at any real risk of eating into significant amounts of muscle tissue. The body definitely can eat into muscle tissue to provide energy for its daily functions when you're in a big deficit, but it's quite a lengthy process and it's usually easier for it to go to the stored fat on my body, of which there is plenty. The only issue with that would be if I was doing things too drastically as there is a limit to how much energy your body can pull from body fat stores at, this, at a time. Now this is something referred to by Martin McDonald and within the research as maximum available energy from adipose tissue and is where a lot of the formulas for calculating your aggressive deficits will come from. So as I've already mentioned here, um, I probably am overshooting this quite a bit with my approach. So there probably is a little bit more of a risk than normal for a little bit of muscle loss. But even then, I'm still not worried because muscle memory is a very real thing that has been shown time and time again in people returning after long layoffs, whether it's lifestyle related or from injury. So if you were to imagine me doing this across a slower six month period instead of this aggressive six week period, Yes, I might not risk losing as much muscle tissue, but there is still a risk there. But the six week period would have me achieving a similar amount of fat loss 
And then being able to spend the next four to five months over that six month time frame, eating back at maintenance or even above maintenance into a surplus to rebuild that muscle tissue. So the net results at the end of this whole six month period would be similar. The only difference is in this short aggressive option, I've been able to only diet for a couple of months instead of six months, which is much better suited to my lifestyle and preferences. And I get to spend more time eating at maintenance, which is important for integrating my new lower body fat into my lifestyle as well, which I think a lot of people need a lot more help with. So that's one of the major themes that you're gonna see popping up as I start going through some of these comments. Doing a longer diet doesn't make you immune to things like losing muscle tissue or any of the negatives associated with being in a more aggressive deficit. You're just as likely to experience the exact same things to the same magnitude over time. The only real difference is that you're choosing to drag it out over a much longer time frame, which for some people may actually make things worse as it's a greater chunk of time that you're exposing your body to the stress of being in a calorie deficit. A six month diet is six months in a calorie deficit where you might find it harder to provide your body with sufficient nutrients and training intensities and suffer because of that. A six week diet is only six weeks. So for sure, if you were to compare the health markers and hormonal levels of both of these cases at the six week mark, I can guarantee you that the aggressive dieters will show absolutely horrible markers, myself included. But they then get to come out of it and bounce right back, whereas the six month dieters will continue to, to diet down to those same bottomed out, bottomed out markers by the end of their diet. Anyway, that should be enough background. Let's start going through some of these comments and getting into a little bit more of the detailed questions from you guys. So um, if you care, you can um, just pause this video and just read through the little write-up I've done here in terms of how much uh, what my body weight is um, and how much protein I'm getting in, a little bit of a summary there. Um, but, okay, question first one is are you still able to keep solid training performance with the drastic calorie deficit? And I'm pretty sure I did answer this already. And most of these questions I have answered, but I'm gonna be able to go through much um, more, in much more detail here for you guys. Um, yes, I do keep um, a very solid training performance all the way through. And this is something that comes up a couple of times um, later through this that people ask me again and again. Um, but I think that the biggest mistake that people make when they're dieting, whether it's an aggressive diet or it's a slow, longer, conservative, drawn out diet, is they're overdoing their training. They're either making a big mistake of increasing their training intensities and increasing their training volumes as they diet to try to burn off more body fat, um, which is a huge mistake because you're on limited resources, which means you're gonna dip into your recovery more, which means you're then going to probably burn yourself out and feel absolutely shit all the time, which is what a lot of people do. Um, but the other mistake, and this is a more general one, is all the time, year round, people are mismanaging their training intensity and their training volume, and they're doing probably too much. On average, I would be recommending around 10 to 20 sets per body part. Um, to be able to build muscle. There are times where I do say go as high as 30, and there will be also random exceptions where you go well above 30 if you're doing extreme conditioning density blocks, or you might go very, very low as well in pure strength peaking blocks. But 10 to 20, maybe a little bit of 30 reps, uh, 30 sets, sorry, is a really good rough guide. So um, for me personally, I consistently hold around this 10 to 15-ish mark for most body parts, most weeks, year in, year, um, day in, day out, for most of the training year, which is not a humongous amount of training required. And the intensity is quite high. I do still try to stay shy of failure points because of the um, unnecessary components, the unnecessary, unnecess unnecessity. I think you guys know what I'm trying to say there. It's not necessarily training to failure because you can get similar muscle building, strength building responses by keeping a few reps in the tank still. Um, so I typically leave between one to three, one to four reps in the tank on most exercises, depending on what I'm doing. Um, definitely as I start to go through a steeper diet like this, I might taper back and say, okay, instead of doing one rep or two reps in the tank, I might do three or four reps in the tank, maybe, but Honestly, the past couple of weeks, I haven't changed that whatsoever and I haven't felt that I needed to either. Um, but the big thing is because I am 
relatively conservative and I guess intelligent or structured around how I'm devoting volume to my training. Um, I don't need to be looking at things like, um, like cutting my volume down. Um, I don't need to be worried about overtraining, over pushing things, even on very limited resources, um, which I think is so, so important. So I just go into a session saying, okay, I've got 10 sets for the entire session, probably not even 10 sets, probably more like eight sets in an entire workout. And it's very easy to space that out over the hour that I'm in the gym and make it productive and make sure I'm getting as much as I can out of it. Because um, there is no reason why you shouldn't be able to maintain your training intensity all the way through unless your training intensity was far too high. Um, yes, how do I feel in training? Um, do you have energies? Yeah, so again, like I still do push very close to failure. Um, most of the times, and this comes back time and time again with a few other answers in here, is um, people are pushing too hard. They don't have a good benchmark for what their intensity, what their minimum training should be. So I think it's really useful to find when you're in a surplus or when you're at maintenance intake, for example, try to find out what is your bottom. Um, what is the minimum amount of volume that you can do to maintain your muscle, to maintain your strength? And you'll find that like this 10 to 20 sets is plenty to build muscle. If you're looking at maintaining muscle, it might even go down towards five or less sets per week per body part, depending on the intensity. And also depending on your experience level, how long you have that muscle tissue for, all those kinds of things. Um, but you'll be surprised how little you can get away with to be able to maintain, especially in a deficit. Um, don't automatically default to the idea that because you're dieting, whether aggressively or not, your body's going to immediately say, oh, let's destroy all your muscle tissue. It won't do that. It won't do that. Like it, it might want to eventually, maybe, probably not, but, but maybe. But really what it's gonna do is gonna say, I've got no more fuel available from food coming to my body. I'm gonna go to my stored energy, which is gonna be your fat, body fat. And again, assuming you're doing things at a rate of about, let's say 1% of your body weight per week, maybe a little bit higher than that, you're not going too crazy with it, um, your body will comfortably get that from your fat stores. Um, that does change a little bit. So as you get leaner, it is harder and harder and harder to get as much energy from your fat stores. Um, even though you still have like fat there, like I've still got, you can look at these photos here, like I've still got a fair amount of fat to lose. I still have, I don't know, if I was to get completely dick skin lean, it might be like, six, five or six kilograms of fat to lose. There is plenty of energy on my body that can sustain my body. Um, but because I'm leaner than say if I was, if I had 20 kilograms of fat to lose, it is just a little bit harder for my body to start to access those fat reserves. I don't really know why that is. I don't know if anybody does know why. Um, I, I really can't remember. Um, but it's something I've definitely seen anecdotally. Uh, but I'm pretty sure there is some evidence supporting that as well. Mm, okay, um, good next question from Arada 2021. So doing this or doing that won't mess up your metabolism. If it's done over a short period, it's okay. What are the upper limits for such a drastic drop in calorie intake? What do you even eat to get enough protein or have the cows be that low? Um, so okay, so got a few questions here. Uh, the first one, simplest one is, what do I even eat to get enough protein? Well, I'm having about 130 to 150 grams of protein per day, which is, um, aiming for about 1.8 to ideally two grams per kilogram of body weight of protein per day to be able to um, help prevent muscle loss. That's a really important key there. Um, but if you took 150 grams of protein at the higher end there, times it by four, because four calories per gram of protein, and you have 600 calories. I would still have another 600 or maybe 400 to 600 calories to devote towards carbohydrates, which usually come from maybe a couple of pieces of fruit and some vegetables, um, and maybe some fats as well, like a little bit of incidental fats from the meats that, uh, the meats that I'm eating, like chicken breast still has fat in it, so it is a very, very lean beef mince. Um, there still be some fats in there, maybe a little bit of cooking oil, and maybe a small portion of nuts or, um, or some butter. So that's it. Actually, not that hard. Um, when people go super high with their protein intake, like three grams per kilogram, or I think even some research show that it's fine, it's suitable to go as high as four grams. Um, just because it's suitable and it's not dangerous doesn't mean that you should be doing it. Um, not because it's bad for you, but because why bother? Why put your body through that when carbs are so much more delicious, you know? Um, 
But when people go super duper high in their protein, that's when they start to run into issues with um, probably, yeah, in a case like this, being able to devote enough calories to everything else. Um, don't get me wrong, this diet still completely sucks. Like it's not fun whatsoever just to have um, a little bit of protein and a little bit of um, carbs, tiny little bit of fat as well. Uh, but if I'm just bringing up here a, um, a sample day, uh, let me come back slightly on this. Um, so this day was uh, 918 calories, which kind of sucks. Had a little bit of beef, some chicken breast. I had um, one kiwi fruit, one protein shake, had some um, sea salt chips and a couple of gluten-free wraps. Um, they're just based on, I think they're just brown rice flour maybe and a couple other ingredients. Um, and I didn't count in here, but I do know I was having about 200-ish calories worth of vegetables. Um, and I would track them in this context. I do track them. I normally don't care about tracking vegetables um, in terms of caring how much you know, to eat it ad libitum. But in this context, I think it's important because it's very, 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 very easy to just inhale four or five capsicums and four or five carrots. And before you know it, that's a significant amount of calories. Um, so this day here, it says 918, but it's probably closer to around, um, uh, probably about 11, 1200. I think I had a couple more days that I did track 21. I think it was the 19th. Maybe I tracked a day there. There we go. Um, another thousand calorie day. I had some oysters, some tuna, and this was a market day. So I got some fresh fresh fish, some fresh seafood, um, scallops, another whey protein isolate check, because I think I was training, um, chicken breast, some little bit of potato, a little bit of um, chips and a kiwi. And again, I would have um, had a, t um, a little bit of vegetables here as well. Um, from memory, I wouldn't have, if I tracked a little bit higher than this, high being a thousand, <laughs> um, I would have counted but had less vegetables in general, which is probably not a good idea. Um, because another question that does come up is, um, how do I get enough nutrients in? Um, the fact is, I, I, I don't. I don't get enough nutrients in. I'm well aware of that. I'm well aware of that. Um, that I'm not getting enough micronutrients into my day by doing this kind of diet. It's probably impossible to be able to get enough of your things like zinc, copper, magnesium, whatever other minerals there are. Um, it's very, very hard to do that um, on a thousand calories. And I do know that a lot of people were kicking up a fuss about that. But the, the counter question is, how many of you guys eating 2,000, 3,000, 2,500 calories, 2,500 calories, how many of you are hitting all your micronutrient daily needs? It's actually very challenging. It's very, very challenging to be hitting all the different um, requisite intakes for iron, zinc, magnesium, um, copper, vitamin C. Well, that's a bit easier having some fruits and vegetables. Um, vitamin A, your B vitamins. It's incredibly challenging, incredibly challenging. Um, so right now I am using a multivitamin. I like Thorn brand supplements. I've used them for a very, very, very long time. Um, I'm currently using, I'm pretty sure it's their basic nutrients for, I've got to double check which one it is, um, but they've got a few out there and they're all dependent on what your needs are. Um, like some of them got iron in them, some of them got copper, some of them don't have copper, some of them don't have iron. Um, depends on what your micronutrient needs. Um, needs up. Um, okay, anyway, going back to this question here from a radar, won't doing that mess up my metabolism? Um, in short, no. No, it doesn't. It won't. Um, because your metabolism, I'm pretty sure I've mentioned this in this um, comment thread here. Um, yes, it's not really, really a thing. So the premise is, the, the idea, the concept is, if you're eating, say, a thousand calories a day, your metabolism is going to slow down all the way down to a thousand calories, and I'm, get, I'm going to reach a point where I'm no longer losing weight despite eating under a thousand calories a day. And then I'm going to have to go down to, say, 500, and then I'll just adapt down even lower, and then I'm going to be entering into what's called starvation mode, which does not exist. But it's this idea where you keep cutting your calories lower and lower and lower and your body just stops losing weight. Look, that really is not a thing because if it was a thing, there would not be issues with starvation and people dying from starvation and, and world hunger. Um, there would not be any instances where your body gets so malnourished that you starve and waste away. It just wouldn't happen because we hit this magical starvation zone, zone point and we just sort of plateau out. It doesn't happen though, unfortunately. 
because starvation mode does not exist. There is something called metabolic adaptation, which is interesting. Um, so that's this concept where, yes, as you do diet down, as you do lose weight, and as you do eat less calories, your metabolism does adapt. You will see changes to your basal metabolic rate, which is the amount of calories your body's burning if you're in a coma, if you're just lying there doing absolutely nothing whatsoever. The amount of calories that you burn, is, that's called your BMR, that will go down as you lose weight. A big chunk of that is because you're a smaller human. If I weighed 100 kilograms, I'll have a BMR of, I don't know, 2000. You wouldn't expect 100 kilogram Eugene to have the exact same metabolic rate as 50 kilo Eugene or 72-ish kilo Eugene that I am right now. They're three very different people, three very different body weights, three very different requirements for energy needs, which means your basal metabolic rate will be different just because of the sheer body weights alone. So as you drop through different um, weight sizes, as you diet down, you will see this adaptation occurring to your basal metabolic rate. Completely normal, it's not dangerous, you're not going to die or burst into flames. Um, there is also changes, there are also changes to something called your non-exercise activity thermogenesis or your NEAT, which is all these subconscious movements that you do. So it's like, it's me fidgeting when I'm talking to you guys. So if I get really, really deep into a deficit and really start adapting to this, and I'll start doing a video, which you might see in a couple of weeks time, I'll just be just so slow and just like, hey guys, let's talk about muscle. <sighs> That's like me slowing right down. Um, because your neat, your fidgeting, your energy, your whatever, your movement, that all goes down. And that is a significant contributor to your total daily energy expenditure. So that is another one of the adaptations that occurs. And this is part of the, your body's self-preservation mechanisms to stop you from wasting away because it's trying to make things slow down. Um, it can happen to a point. It can happen, it can keep adapting down to a certain point and it'll always be within, I'm pretty sure, I might be wrong on this, but I'm pretty sure 99% of the time it is on par with the amount of weight loss you're doing and the amount that you are creating deficits and the amount that you are dropping things down. So as long as I'm dropping, dropping weight, I will see decreases in my BMR, completely normal. Um, the longer I diet, the longer, that, the longer that I'm in a deficit, the more that I'll start to see these changes to my needs, which honestly, for me, is another argument to say we should be doing a more aggressive approach to dieting because there's less time for your body to start to change all this fidgeting and neat activity. Okay, that doesn't happen overnight. It happens on a gradual basis. So drawing things out, it gives you more opportunity to create this adaptation over time where you see those decreases and declines in, in neat. Um, this is part of why people try to do things like step counting or doing more workouts or training harder and for longer when they're dieting. And um, it's a big, big, big mistake. It's a huge mistake. Actually, I did come across something quite interesting, I think last week. Um, I came across a research article that was showing that um, doing more exercise, I'm not sure if it was when dieting or not, but doing more exercise may actually um, cause bigger compensations to occur to your metabolism where it slows down or adapts more. Quite interesting because the general consensus is um, if you were to do more exercise, that like if I was to go for a run, extra bit of cardio or whatever, that would then increase my energy expenditure for the day, which means, yeah, I'm going to lose more weight. Um, and then the more cardio I do, the more it'll increase my energy debt, which means, hey, great, awesome, more fat loss. There is also the idea that if you do certain types of training, like HIIT training or, um, or, or even weights training, that will create not just a debt from the training that you've done, but it will create this long-term lasting elevation in your total daily energy expenditure. And that makes sense too. Um, but what this paper was showing, um, and it's not definitive whatsoever, so don't say this is like, this means that we're all fucked and we're all gonna die. This is just like an interesting tidbit. Uh, more than anything else, it needs more research to really elucidate what it really means. But there, it was showing that more exercise that people were doing, it was showing more compensation occurring to their metabolism, which I think is really cool. So the more exercise that you do, your body makes up for it by slowing down or down tuning your NEAT and slowing down your BMR within its limits as well. Um, and potentially creating this um, mess to your metabolism, but it's just more adaptation. Found that interesting. Um, just showing that, like, I guess chasing more and more and more activity all the time, um, which is a huge thing people doing when they're dieting, is just is just silly. 
And this is why I've always been a big proponent of saying, like, do your cardio to be conditioned for fitness, for heart health. Do your training so you're strong, you have muscle mass, you can build muscle. Um, focus on your diet for the fat loss. Create a deficit in your diet for fat loss. Don't try to train your, um, your body leaner. All right, um, let's go through a couple more of these questions. There were some really interesting things. Um, just on that as well, I do know, I do remember somebody bringing up um, a study showing that Biggest Loser contestants, like people going through the Biggest Loser show, they had um, run through the rigors of extreme dieting, extreme training, and it ruined their metabolism. And six years later, I'm pretty sure it was, this is a pretty famous paper, six years later, all of these subjects were still unable to eat significantly more calories. They were just like bottomed out um, at whatever this super duper low maintenance now was. Um, which honestly um, is a very extreme case. And I would say that, I don't know for sure, but um, it's probably because of the extreme amounts of training and the extreme amounts of stress and the extreme insult that, um, physical insult, physical stress that was placed upon their body through the biggest loser, which is unsustainable. Absolutely, I agree with that. Um, this on the other hand is not about doing things unsustainable. This is about being intelligent, saying, okay, I wanna get in, get out. Six weeks in, six weeks out, or six weeks in and stop forever, maintain my new lean set points or whatever it is, try to create a new set point. That's what we're all about here. Um, the thing to keep in mind is that yes, metabolisms do slow down, but they can also speed right back up. So I don't like to use the word slow down, speed up. Adaptation is a better term, which is what's being put out more in the industry now. Your metabolism will adapt down as you um, get smaller, as you um, put yourself through longer and longer and steeper deficits, completely normal. But the thing is, when you come right back out of it, it's not an issue because it will adapt right back up as well. So I just said that when you diet more, you'll see decreases in NEAT, you'll also see increases in NEAT, and you'll see me getting all hyper and hyperactive when I put food right back in. So it's not a big issue at all. So I kind of answers this question here um, from Hannah Michelle K as well. Will I add or increase steps and cardio as I get further into the six to eight weeks to continue to lose weight? I won't, because I shouldn't need to. There is very little chance that my BMR is ever going to adapt below say 1000 calories or 1200 calories, unless I was doing something really stupid with my training. So it's always going to be usually always going to um, be a deficit for me to be eating this much food. So my body will continue to drop fat. Um, I might, if anything, to be a bit more strategic and actually increase my calories as I get leaner because, as I said, it's gonna be harder and harder for my body to access fat from my fat stores as I get leaner. And that's where I will start to risk cannibalizing muscle tissue. Um, do I think the same applies to women? In the sense of, in, in the sense of slashing calories to be in a deficit. Because I would assume that would drastically mess with their hormones, right? Yeah, so um, it does apply to women. You can do, women can do this as well, okay? I don't think everybody should be doing this whatsoever. I don't think everybody should be dieting though either, okay? I did get this popping up a couple of times from other people saying, um, this is unsustainable, this is, this is crash dieting, this is dangerous. I'm like, well, dieting in general, can be crash dieting, whether it's a short stint like this or it's a, um, a long-term diet, it can be viewed as unsustainable, it can be viewed as creating a negative relationship with food, it can be viewed as bad, um, objectively bad, from the influences it has on the person's psychology and on their health, male or female. Um, so like in the case here, women, it can definitely mess with their hormones. I guarantee you by the end of this dieting phase in a few more weeks, my testosterone, I mean, it's already always quite low, but it's gonna be bottomed out um, from this. And I don't expect it to be super high. I don't expect myself to be feeling awesome by the time I get super duper lean from doing this. I wouldn't expect that from being in a long deficit either. Um, this isn't about creating a big crash result. This is about just choosing an appropriate time frame and an end date for you and your dieting goal and you and your fat loss goals. You can do it over six months, you can do it over six weeks, choice is yours. Um, and yeah, like any damage that it, that it can potentially do um, to hormones or whatever for women or for men, they're prone to seeing that in longer diets as well. You're not necessarily going to preserve yourself by, um, by doing it for longer like I already mentioned. And if anything, if you do see some damage or ill effects from doing it in six weeks, guess what, it's only six weeks. You can then spend six months putting your body back to maintenance or do it overnight, which I prefer to do, and feeling fantastic. So that's what I'll be looking at. 
Um, I don't notice any drastic change in strength whatsoever. I might towards the end. Um, okay, now another question here you can see, won't the shorter slash faster approach negatively impact your assembly metabolic rate profoundly? As I said, no, it doesn't. Um, I don't struggle with energy that much with my calories being low. That's a really important thing to note though, is that um, year round before starting this diet, and this is the most important thing that people are really gonna mess up. I'm kind of annoyed I've mentioned this now on the start of this video, because most people are gonna have already switched off. But the most important thing you should be thinking about before starting any dieting phase is, is your body prepared from a health standpoint to withstand the rigors and the stress of dieting? Whether it's a six week diet or a six month diet or a six year diet, it is stressful on your body. And you wanna make sure that you're getting in the right nutrients, you have your lifestyle stress managed, you have your work life stress, whatever managed, you have your training managed to all be optimized before starting a dieting phase. Because you are adding more and more stress to your body, you're taking away nutrients, you're taking away resources, you're putting your body into a state where it's not going to be ideal for it to be continuing to thrive with regards to health. So make sure it's all set up beforehand so you can start dipping into it if you absolutely need to. So I made sure I was doing that well before I started dieting for, for months on end. I also make sure like year round, I don't rely on stimulants or caffeine. I don't drink coffee much. I don't do pre-workouts. I don't take any stimulants whatsoever. Um, I might have in the past a coffee once every couple of months. That's my source of caffeine year round. Um, I intentionally do that because I think that we just overuse caffeine in general, but also I do it to save it for moments like this where I feel like, okay, I'm on 1200 calories a day. I'm probably gonna have days where I feel absolutely terrible. I'm gonna have days where my sleep gets interrupted as well and I still have to get stuff done. So that's where I'm gonna dip into using caffeine. So now I have caffeine, I have coffee maybe twice a week. So not even every training day. I have it on my bigger training days or on bigger work days and that's it. And I'll have um, a double espresso. So about 150, maybe 200 milligrams of, of caffeine. All right. Um, as far as does this approach slow your metabolism? Again, no, it does not. Um, yeah, ideally eat, mo don't, you don't have to eat mostly calories from protein, just make sure you're having um, at least two grams per kilogram of, um, of protein. Um, would this not, yeah, so again, you can see it, so many questions here. Would this not crash your metabolism and make you have to eat less when returning to a gaining phase? It does not, um, it won't whatsoever, so you don't need to worry about that. How do I determine the macros for carbs and fats? Um, Protein is optimal for maintaining muscle mass, but is there a method how I split carbs and fats? There isn't, it's just preference. When it comes to fat loss, um, doesn't matter whatsoever. Have enough protein and be in a calorie deficit and you'll be preserving muscle tissue. Um, I would try to buy us more carbs for training, recovery, training performance, but really when it's that low, it's hard to make the, um, make the judgment call there because you don't want to do more carbs and then go zero fats all the time because fats are an important part of just basic functioning and basic health. Okay, there are essential fats that you don't want to be depleting your body of and missing out on for weeks on end. Not a good idea. Um, so I would be mindful of that. Um, how long should you stay in this kind of thing? As long as it takes. I'm quite lean, so it's gonna be six to eight weeks. If somebody had 30 kilos of body fat to lose, if they were ridiculously fat, I would say keep going. I would say go as long as you need to. And I'm not like, that would then get them losing the weight maybe in 30 weeks and not three years, for instance. Um, it's completely up to the person though. You can always do this and then jump back up to maintenance for a couple of weeks, do it again and do little stop starts like that. That's completely fine as well. Um, okay, another big one. Big, big, big one. Um, the concern is how to get back to normal after the end of the diet without getting back all the weight lost. Great question here, and I know it comes up quite a few times from a few people in here. Um, let me see if I can even find one. Uh, maybe, maybe I can't, maybe I can't. Um, how do you come back after the diet period is over? Um, there were a few things I remember seeing about um, yeah, reverse dieting. We use reverse diet approach after the cut is over. So essentially how will I end this cut? Um, I'll go right back to maintenance and I'll do it overnight. I won't do a reverse diet. I don't really believe much in reverse dieting. That's something to believe in, but I don't do reverse dieting much because I don't think it's necessary. Um, the reason why people put on weight after going through a long dieting period 
um, is because apart from fluid and glycogen gains, which are completely unavoidable, but when you increase your food, if you've chosen your maintenance calories or your calorie range correctly, maintenance calories is the amount of calories you need to maintain your weight, not to put on. So if I end up weighing, say, 70 kilograms and, I, uh, and I'm eating 1,200 calories a day, 1,200 calories is a deficit for 70 kilograms. For 70 kilograms to be at maintenance, it may be something like, I don't know, again, two and a half-ish thousand calories. That's probably a little bit high now, but say 2,300 calories. So I can eat as high as 2,000, 2,300 calories or a net increase of about 1,000 calories and not put on significant amounts of weight apart from fluid and glycogen levels um, because it's maintenance. If you see big blowouts in your weight from putting your calories right back up, it's because you went into a surplus. It's because you weren't meticulous or you weren't tracking where your maintenance is and you weren't understanding that your new maintenance from dieting will be different. It will be different um, because you're a smaller person. You've got less energetic needs. And also not, not knowing how to be um, reactive to, um, to changes. So when you put yourself back to maintenance, we're doing guesswork here. We're gonna get it wrong nine times out of 10. So the thing is, when you put your calories back up to maintenance, if you overshoot a little bit, pull back a little. If you undershoot and don't put on much weight at all, you can try to go a little bit higher, see what happens. Because maintenance is a range of, you know, around two to 500 calories, depending on the person and their body weight. Um, but there's a big range that you can eat within and you can maintain your body weight. So again, for me, ending a diet at 1,000 calories, I would go straight back up straight back up to um, 12, uh, sorry, to um, two to two and a half thousand calories. That's my plan. That's my plan to, on, on what to do. Um, anyway, oh, I love seeing this. Um, Christian Thibodeau, uh, this is the, if you guys don't, don't know who Christian Thibodeau is, he's an all round badass. Um, he's one of the uh, absolute OGs in this fitness industry who's been around more than most of the influencers out there. And most of the influencers out there wouldn't even know they've been influenced by him in some way. Um, so it's really cool to see that this is something that he aligns himself with as well. Um, puts Pat on my back. I'm gonna pat myself on the back for that one. Um, but he's a cool dude. Um, what did he say? Yeah, he does this too uh, for about three to four weeks. Um, he's, he stays super lean most of the time as well. So he can't afford to go much um, much longer than that. Um, like if I, if I was starting at his starting points, I wouldn't be going for the six to eight weeks that I am now. I'd be going for again, three to four weeks. Um, anyway, look, I think this video is getting probably a little bit too long and drawn out. Um, if you guys have any other questions about any of this stuff, drop them below. Happy to answer any questions. Um, I might do a follow-up video for you guys as well. But hopefully that helps to answer some of the main concepts and questions around dieting in general, but also more specifically, aggressive dieting like this. Um, any questions at all, pop them below. Hope you enjoyed this video and learned something useful. And I will see you all next time. Have a great day. Don't forget if you haven't already, you should definitely get a free trial to my app, Gambaru Method, where you get full access to all of my extended training programs, workouts, educational content, diet tracker, and macro calculators. You can do all this cool stuff. Um, link is in the description below. Check it out, you'll be supporting me, you'll be supporting this channel, you'll be supporting a lot more free content. I already said have a great day, but have an even better day if you're stuck around this long. All right, see you later, guys.